do it today is to talk very, very briefly about the selection for the four W projects that are going to be taking place next semester. Uh, did you get an email from Kathy? Okay, so uh, very simple. There will be three projects. Uh, two of these structures are not present here today. Uh, but Dr. Mahalik will be talking about the uh, process system project. I will very briefly talk about uh, the, the two other projects. The first one is offered by Dr. Dwight Howley. He's a, a person that works with Sish to Hill, a consulting an environmental engineering consulting company based in the States, but he's, he works in the doctoral office. And what the project is about is uh, designing a waste laundry plant, sizing it, costing it, um, making an analysis of how large it needs to be to, to provide the necessities of a certain population for the next 25 years. So it has a component of modeling, it has a component of uh, costing that you talked about before, and um, economic analysis is going to be a lot of years for so he has been doing it for uh, two or three years, so um, you will not get a, you will not be guinea pigs. That's good, that's already been done by somebody else. And uh, the second project is by Dr. Marco Saban. Dr. Saban is uh, essentially in charge of the pilot plants uh, facility in Xerox. Um, he is incredibly knowledgeable on polymers. And the way that he typically runs the project is that you have to actually design what type of product you are going to be making is a speciality polymer for a semiconductor application. So you'll be designing, sizing the plants, uh, selecting what process you batch continues. So all of those decisions uh, essentially have to go through the entire process design. So these are the two projects. Uh, Dr. Mahalik will cover the third one. A couple of things, how the projects are selected. So you have to pick uh, or print or email the page or the documents that can be sent to you and specify what your preferences are. Okay, so I want the, my first preference is Dr. Mahalik's project. Okay? And then you make second, first, second, and third one. Okay. So at the end we have, we have a constraint. The constraint is that we have to have equal distribution of students across the three projects. You cannot have one project that is overpopulated and the second project that is underpopulated. So mostly things even out naturally. So naturally things will be distributed in a pretty good way. So in some cases there is ne it's necessary to move people around. So in the past it was, Dr. Philippe, can you please make me, find me a spot in, there are spots that I cannot find. Right, so, uh, so we came up with a strategy that is it's, um, fair and unfair at the same time, uh, which is based on grades. So when it come, comes to the decision of if we have to switch some students from one project to the other, it's based on grades. I understand that the passion for a particular area is very important, but it's difficult to measure pressure. Passion is probably infinite by definition, but uh, if it is not, we don't have a way of quantifying things. So, unfortunately, it's done with grades, but it's, that's uh, usually applicable for a very, very small number of cases. So, any questions on how selection or process of the project is done? So, create it, uh, return it to Kathy by no later than November the 30th, or email it to me or to Kathy. Okay? Any other questions? No? Okay, so uh, yes, sir. Uh, when are we told the projects? Uh, by in December, you'll, yeah. Pretty much like uh, the time that it takes to process, then maybe so that you also have a foresight. Okay? So, uh, in terms of teaching evaluations, uh, both of the adults and three are very well uh, evaluated by the students, so very light. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's up to the instructor to do. Okay. So um, typically, I think that uh, groups are self-forming, but it's up to the instructor. I don't know how Dr. Mahalik does this thing. Okay. So, one thing. Uh, the project 
that I uh, lead is uh, also dealing with uh, designing a plant, uh, uh, designing control strategies for the plant, hazard analysis, and so on, costing. I like to position that as typically an open-ended project. So uh, instead of saying, you will design a plant that does this and that, and this is the capacity, uh, we start with, okay, this is the problem that we want to solve, and you need to decide what the solution is, what alternatives there are, and eventually design a plan that will deliver the solution. So, for instance, last year we were working on the production of biofuels in Ontario, and the question is, of each team decide which biofuel you will produce and why, by like making biodiesel or bioethanol or something else, to decide what your raw materials are making a decision, decide where your plant is going to be located if you're making, say, uh, ethanol, if you're making biodiesel, where you locate the plant and how much land you need, and how will you transport it to the market. So a lot of times it tends to, discussions in the class tend to be, so Dr. Mahalik, how big is the plant? Well, you need to decide on the Oh, where should the plant be? Because we need to decide where the plant is. Because these are the kind of things you will actually do in practice in real life. In the years when he took a third year heat transfer course and said, calculate heat transfer for this thing and you just plug it into a formula on a given page, that's kind of coming to an end because we go through real life and, and work in practice, right? Um, lastly, we almost got to the point that we could optimize also the land use in terms of rotation of the crops and how much to dedicate towards or some of the alignment between the optimization force and this force didn't quite work, so we didn't optimize uh, how much uh, land to dedicate to each crop. I like to do it in a way that you have to pull back on all of your background and make sure you apply it when you so far. So it's a lot of fun. It's partially uh, we talk about specific topics, and if you like, I'm on the whiteboard and talking about specific topics and quote unquote lecturing. A lot of it is about interaction and discussion and intermediate checkpoints to make sure that you are rolling along and you are writing different parts of your report as the term goes on. So by the time the term is at the end, you're practically finished with the report. The last thing I want is, last, is a week before the report is due, everybody goes starts writing from page one and write like crazy to produce something. There's no point creating this kind of pressure situation. Uh, whether we'll do the diesel plant or not, or some other biofuels in general, or something else, I need to decide yet. Uh, so we'll see at the beginning of that. But in general, this is the structure. select the teams themselves. Most of the time works are very well. But four years ago I had a team with a boy that we took and I was thinking it was obvious that he was doing all the work and she was getting all the credit. Right? Uh, so the year after that I said, no, I will select the teams because if you work on the job, you have no choice. The manager tells you, you three guys on the team design the plan, right? That did not work out very well because the personal interactions they ended up with some teams that people just didn't get along and they spent more time fighting than doing the work. So I backed off from that and I said, you just pick the teams and I'll very carefully watch, make sure everybody does a fair amount of work. Okay. Anything else? No? Okay, so what I'd like to do, I'd like to spend about five minutes talking about Master of Engineering Design program which is an interdisciplinary master's program that I run at the School of Engineering Practice. Kevin, what do I do with this thing? Push on Push any button? Oh, great. Okay. So this is an interdisciplinary program that lasts two months. It is for people who want to 
advance their capabilities and do not plan to go for PhD. As compared to the Master of Life Science, when the objective is to do research and prepare the really for PhD, this is to prepare you to go to university. <laughs> We try to cover three areas of competence. One is leadership and organizational skills. The other one is innovation and design. And the third one is technical expertise. When we are starting the program, I talked to a number of companies, and they said, if your emphasis is going to be technical expertise, don't bother doing it because there's a lot of programs that do that already. The issue is not so much solving more equations and fancy equations. The issue is more in terms of can people actually lead the teams and work with members of the team, and can they come up with innovative approaches to solve the problems. So it's a 12 month program. It takes six courses total. Leadership and management courses required to be taken by all the students. That's mandatory. And starting this year, I highly recommend that most of the students take also a course on creativity and innovation. It's an introductory course to these concepts, and the idea behind the course is really to try to make sure that when you're looking at something, at the problem to be solved, they actually understand what is the problem that you're trying to solve. What are, are you solving the symptoms or are you solving the real problem? And how do you come up with alternatives? Uh, and the course is taught by a gentleman who has an MBA from Rotten School. He also studied, studied engineering at the college and then switched to science. And he is now a senior innovation officer at the Royal Bank of Canada. You may not think that the bank has an innovation office, but actually have a team of people that work on innovating new products for the bank and new facilities for the bank and so on. So if you, if you go to Burlington uh, on, uh, I think on Guelph Line, uh, north of UAW, there's a new Royal Bank branch that was designed by these people and it looks completely different than any other bank branch. And then in the summer, you do a project from May to August full time. Uh, most of the time in the company, Last two years, about 40% of the students who work on the project in the company uh, have been paid. There's a funding formula that allows us to uh, share the cost between the company and the uh, MITEX, which is a government organization that matches 50% of the payment. So that for four months, students get paid $15,000. There are three fields of study sustainable community for our design and process systems. Sustainable community is not only about infrastructure, which you often think about, but it's also about development of local economy. So that if you're living in a community, hopefully you can all work there because there are jobs there. And how do you identify opportunities in a local area to start companies or run specific businesses? Product design is about solving problems in general. It is not specifically about designing a chair, or designing a desk, or designing a house. For instance, we had a project uh, last year, two students working with a hospital here in McMaster to solve the issue of children crying before and during and after surgery. So they came up with a solution that went through very successful preliminary trials and hospital is now working on organizing 2,000 children, a couple of years clinical trial uh, and it is as positive as we expect to become a standard practice in the hospital. On the other hand, we have a student mechanical they're working with a small company here in Hamilton where he completely helped them redesign their product and shortened manufacturing time from five to seven days to a day. And that was more classical if you like design that you think about. Okay. Process systems is very much of work about operation and design of uh, 
chemical plants and refineries, pharmaceutical industries, <coughs> more important to think about as far as that is done. Sample projects, for instance, we did a tool for designing solar greenhouses for a company in Welland uh, because they found that they are losing the bids against other competition uh, for the last couple of years. We had a student optimizing design of a PV solar power station in California who worked with the Indian company Phoenix. Uh, we just completed a prototype of a machine that would help immobile patients who may be in coma or just immobile because of operation uh, exercise their legs. Uh, and we're going to continue that to the next stage of the prototype. Anxiety. For instance, we work on data reconciliation algorithm for an optimization algorithm for the safety networks. We have hybrid models for the installation units, waste heat, of heat recovery at the FASCOM, joint project in cash that we just finished. We have people working on design of LRT corridor in Hamilton. Uh, we have twice teams working with collapsible freight container. That's an interesting problem because to buy a used freight container, but those are things that come on the back of the truck, costs four thousand dollars. If you fill it with the goods to ship it to Northwest Territory to bring the empty container back is ten thousand dollars. So when the companies do they buy used containers, fill it with the fill it with the stuff, ship the things northwest to Northwest Territories, and then leave the uh, containers there. As a result of that, garbage is just accumulating. You have piles of containers sitting in the Northwest Territories and nobody's bringing them back. If you could make collapsible container that you can squash the thing and put five of them on the back of the truck, now it costs $2,000 to bring it back. So I mean, it's going to be economical to do it and bring it back. Right? So these are sample projects. Sample projects. Tuition fee is approximately $16,000. Uh, you can think of it this way as it costs $16,000. Well, if you work hard on, with us on identifying the project, then you get paid, you basically pay for the tuition. You will also be one year early out of school, then you get the paid money. Uh, I said 40% students are paid. For more information, you can search engineering design at McMaster, and the web page will come up. Or you can send me an email, or you can send an email to Mrs. Smalik, who is the administrator of the program, or you can send an email to design at McMaster.ca. Questions? Yes? You get a master's in applied science or a master's in engineering? You get a master's in engineering. Okay. What are requirements in terms of GPA or? Okay. Official McMaster requirement to enter graduate school is B minus in your fourth year. I look at courses at grades in the third year and the second year. Because I think they really show who's working hard and applying. Forty summer grades tend to jump if you look at the average. So I look very hard at the third and the second year. It's a rolling uh, admission, so when you apply the evaluate and basically fits the recommendation of the center. Anything else? So anyway, if you have any questions, just feel free to drop by us in the email or send them to the Okay? Yes? Uh, is there any that you can count that year towards uh, your key edge? <coughs> well, uh, the year does not count. A couple of other things that happens is because you take a leadership course and you take a project management course, uh, you, those are sufficient hours to give you qualification for a junior project manager. Uh, some of these are cut, cut to, counts towards PN, but I'm not sure whether you mean that this whole year counts as PN. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I don't think so. We're trying to clarify that actually.
do, do not forget to send the uh, selections uh, before November the 30th. Okay, so uh, the SQL memo was posted to the website. Uh, I'm sure most of you have read it by now. Just on the last, uh, the last level for me on the project, so there's some important information there. Anything that's uncertain, just get back to me. Uh, also, just on these uh, design projects that uh, Dr. Mahalik was speaking about, um, I've co supervised and supervised students on them before in the MH program. I'm, I'm always happy to supervise students that work on projects related to my interests and that coincide. And so, for example, um, I just had a phone call actually on Friday from one of the students I worked with, Tiffany D'Souza, and she's working on PepsiCo. So it gets tremendous recognition for the project she did in PepsiCo on, uh, we just implemented design of experiments in from 43 and it saved, saved a ton of money and she still gets it to a recognition from the company for that, for that project. And then I co-supervised other students on um, statistical data analysis in their project. So if it's something that you, you're interested in and you do a project and it coincides with my interests as well, I'm happy to do supervise. What critical safety issue have people street in Canada? Something in Quebec. Quebec, what happened? Uh, a bioresources company had a huge explosion, killed three people, injured 19. <laughs> The cause is not known yet. Please read the newspaper and find out what happens when they release the causes. So these happen periodically. We need to learn from these mistakes as engineers. There was a huge storage tank of methanol on the site, but that's all that's been said in the newspaper. So that happened Thursday or Friday uh, in Sherbrooke, Quebec. So uh, read, read the newspapers and make sure you, you see when that report is released on what the cause is, that you understand what happened so we don't repeat this in our careers in the future. Okay? And you should be doing this all the time as part of self-directed learning that you stay up to date with what's going on um, in Canada, North America, and other countries. Okay, so I thought uh, this last class, we, we don't have too much time, but I wanted to just wrap up the operability topic. And then next class, uh, we, there's two more classes, Thursday and Friday, I'll uh, introduce the topic of troubleshooting, and then we have a tutorial on troubleshooting on Monday. So to wrap up this operability section, I posted some slides on the course website. And what I'll do is I'll, because of the limited time even still now, I'll, I'll just go through some selected ones of these slides. These first few are reliability. They're very straightforward to understand. There's enough material and writing on the slides that the topic is, is um, straightforward enough for you to understand conceptually. So I'll pass over reliability. Mentioning though that you should understand these formulas of uh, series structures and parallel structures. So uh, it's not hard to understand what those formulas are part of uh, doing. And then take a look at this worked example, make sure you can compute these numbers yourself and understand then that the principle here is that if you've got a sequence of systems and each system is 90% reliable, the overall system is only 73% reliable. It's a very low level of reliability there. However, if I decide to duplicate this entire system A with a parallel system, so I split my stream, now my reliability jumps up to 93%. So tremendous reliability, but comes at the doubling of the capital costs. Okay, so it's a constant trade-off between our ability to use the system. Here we're only going to have 73% uh, reliability. And here we get the tremendous bump up to 93%. I could also look at a slight alternative is, is make each module, one, two, and three, in, in parallel, bring those streams together, then bring it into parallel again and, and split it up. And then that overall reliability takes it up even higher still to 97%. So understand that concept um, in your learning. But where I wanted to, to talk about was um, this back to this case study we've been looking at earlier. The, the issue here is we were looking at an integrated energy system. So you, you have this on the slides on the second page there of the PDF. Where we were heating up the stream, we were heating up that stream using the outlet from this exothermic reactor. So this is very common to um, save energy. We, we have our heat coming in, heat heated, and exothermic reaction takes place in that cathode. 
that hot fluid leaves the, leaves the reactor and we use that to preheat our cold chain coming in. But as, as we've got the answers to these questions in the, in the notes, uh, the disadvantages of that obviously are related to starting up that system. If we start up the system, we've got our fresh heat coming in, but we've got no way to preheat it because the output from our reaction has not been as is not warm enough to supply that necessary energy. So startup is an issue. Uh, we've got lower flexibility there in terms of operating process, and we've also got some dynamics that we'll talk about in a minute where there's a, a big delay through that before I see that heat. And dynamics will come back and, and, and bite you again in the recycle. And that's true for all recycle streets. So in today's class, we're going to talk a little bit about startup and shutdown, recycle and purging, and how we handle that. And there's a common theme, bypass and parallel structures. And bypass and parallel structures really help us tremendously. We've seen that as before when we looked at the operating window. Bypass provides increased reliability and flexibility in the process. We saw that bypass around the heat exchanger in the previous class. Increased our ability to have a, a greater flexibility in the process. Um, and then we've seen there in the reliability section I just showed you uh, with the parallel structures. By going to parallel structures, we, we increase our reliability overall the process as well. So this is uh, where I said earlier, Many of the things we improve on our flow sheet, maybe for increasing our operating rate, or maybe we do it to increase efficiency in the process, end up solving another objective as well. So common theme is bypass and parallel structures help for addressing many of these, these operability issues. So let's take a look then at this, this sequence. If I were to look at that process, start it up and shut down, I'm relying on heating my feet. I need to preheat my feet before I send it into the reactor. And that's just to get that exothermic reaction going. If I send in cold feet, that I'm not able to achieve the activation energy required to, to get started. So preheat is necessary. It's not that I can just put in cold feet here and kind of get a weak reaction going and then hope for this recycle to kick in and, and for the system to kind of boot, boot itself up. I really do need to get a warm feed into that pack bed to start the reaction system. Furthermore, even if the system were weak, weak uh, if I put in a cold feed and I got a weak exothermic reaction, and I'm relying on that heat to come and preheat, and then I get a slightly warmer stream, and I'm relying on this recycle here, I'm getting this hot circuit going, you can also see how that can be a safety issue. Okay? So there's safety involved in there we're talking about. To start up my process, if I rely on a weak heat of reaction from this cold stream and then that, that slightly warmer feed comes around and now preheats, and then I have a second time around and a third time around, we can see how this is incredibly wasteful as well. I'm going to spend hours and hours and maybe even days waiting for this cold feed to slowly heat itself up and creating a huge amount of old specification products over here that I cannot sell. Maybe because that reaction hasn't gone to completion, and so the impurities, the unreacted uh, reactant that's coming through here is too high the concentration that I really cannot sell that stream. So to efficiently get started with minimal off-spec production near the beginning, I need to preheat that stream in some way, and I cannot rely on the reactor to be doing that for me. So common theme for recycled streams when we need energy integration is to provide an alternative form of energy integration that does not, sorry, an alternative form of energy input or energy removal that does not rely on the integrated stream itself. So we have a redundant unit here. We have a second heat exchanger that's now being heated by steam or some utility from the plant. Some stream that we can rely on to provide that heating source. And these heat exchangers don't need to be sized identically. But this heating fluid needs to be at least sufficient that I can at least get my startup. 
by supplying the you know, an appropriate amount of This also provides me some additional flexibility. If, for some reason, this heat exchanger up here that I normally would be using to cool down my reactor effluent and preheat my feed, if this heat exchanger had a leak or was fouled and had to be taken out of service for a period of time for maintenance, I now have the flexibility up here and reliability of this backup heat exchanger. So this backup heat exchanger is serving two purposes. One is it's aiding my startup and shut uh, startup sequence and it's assisting me to boost my overall reliability of my process. Okay. And that's important just to come back to the reliability. Maybe I should not have quite skipped so fast over the very first slide. Let's just go right back to the first slide and we'll hang out. Was we understand this intuitively, so but maybe just to emphasize it. Here's, a, here's an overall flow sheet where I've got a reaction system, a pump, and then there's a separation system and a bit of recycling. It's clear that if one of these units has to be taken out for maintenance, that flow sheet pretty much has to be shut down. And that's not something we can do. We know that intuitively, and we, we know it from what we've learned about so far in chemical engineering. These chemical pro processes are not shut down. Um, maybe a year for a few days at a time, at the very most. Some systems are not shut down ever. They're kind of maintained in, in a way that they can always be operating because that expense of lost sales when you're shutting down, where you put all this material that's inside the piping, inside the reactors, inside your separators, you have to get that material out of your system in some way as you start, as you shut down the process. Okay, so you have to deal with all this startup material, all the shutdown material, and discard it because often off specification you cannot sell this. Um, you have to shut down your heating and your cooling utilities. These integrated units have to be shut down, and those are hard to bring back up online again. And often, the most time that damage occurs is when we're starting up and shutting down. That, that's true for many systems. Aircraft experience the most accidents that take off and landing. Cars experience some critical damage when you're pulling out of your driveway, right? so, or in the parking lot. So things during startup and shutdown experience damage more, more, more likely than at other times. So we don't want to shut down a process just when we need to make a, make a change. So same, same thing here. If one of these heat exchanges went down, we've got a backup that we could be using. Another feature that's important to start up and shut down, and if you're looking at this in your operability section of your SDL project, is the use of intermediate storage. So many processes rely on sizing the storage tank, and they will place that storage tank of the appropriate size, we'll talk about it in a minute, the size that should be, but they'll place the storage tank in between sections of the process. And you choose your sections so that they're decoupled. What do we mean by decoupled? It's a word you've used in process control. But decoupled essentially is parts of the processes that have no interaction. So section B here has no interaction with section A. So it's a perfect location for intermediate storage. Whether the design actually requires it or not, it's a good practice to put that intermediate storage there because it gives you some increased flexibility with your process, but it will also help you for startup and shutdown. For example, if section B has to be shut down to maintain and clean out these trays in the distillation columns over there, I can keep operating section A for a period of time while section B is being maintained. Because I can cool down my feed and send it to storage, build up an inventory there in that storage, and that inventory then will be used when section B starts up again. So I don't need to turn off section A, and vice versa. So anytime you've got decoupling in your process, perfect location for storage tank. Now, we can have a recycle here, potentially from section B back over to section A. Okay. 
So if we have recycled from section B to section A, that's it. We, we have an issue there. Because now I have an interaction from B coming to A. I cannot shut down one of my units because I've got that, that feedback coming, coming back at me. But what you can do is in the recycle stream, you can put a storage tank as well. So if section B had some feedback, say the bottom's product from this distillation call had to come back and be reprocessed, I can add an intermediate storage unit in the recycle from stream B so that I can still keep operating. So storage tanks are tremendously useful for that, but they will require some auxiliary equipment. Ordinarily, I would take this hot stream straight to the distillation call, but now I'm storing it, so I would need to cool it down first before I take it to the storage tank. Let's assume that part A of my process is shut down for maintenance, and I've accumulated some inventory in part B, I'm uh, sorry, in this, I've accumulated some inventory in my storage tank that I want to send to part B, Normally, this distillation tank steps a warm stream. Now I have to preheat it first. So this is wasteful. You don't normally go through your inventory tank. At normal operation, I would go straight from the exit from this reactor straight to the separator. So we need to add a bypass as well. So that's for regular operation. We will bypass the tank so that we don't cool down, go to inventory, and then heat back up again. So that's, that would be wasteful. So bypass is critical here. The inventory of the storage tank is important as well. And then the size of that tank needs to be at least equal to the time we expect to shut down either A or B. So whichever is the long goal you see. And then usually we, we put a buffer in there of about 50%. So we, we've got some estimates from previous experience how long it would take to shut down the process. So companies are quite comfortable knowing that it takes at least a week to clean distillation columns. So if you've got a crew working in parallel, one crew on each column, one, two, and three, taking a week each to clean out that column and bring it back to service, we need at least a week's worth of inventory and storage here. Um, so that or, so we, we empty this tank out and build up a week's worth of inventory while process A is still operating. So many, yeah, Jason. What happens when you bring it back online and you have A producing what it normally would plus, and then having that flow to B plus this extra week of storage to B's? B's yeah, so B's got to catch up. So there needs to be some some uh, capability for B, section B, to work at 120% of designs. So that's why we don't just design for 100% case. We design for 100, 110, 120. That's what we learned about in the operating room section. So that, that inventory can be drawn down. We'll still be using our heat exchanger over here during that time to heat up the material from the storage tank. And we'll be running our bypass at the same time to, to boot up. So, so startup and shutdown sequencing needs, needs a lot of thought. So this is, a, this is the important part here. A detailed startup and shutdown plan is, is tough to come by. You really need to think very carefully about all your units and how they interact with each other. And the streams, particularly the recycled streams, coming back in. Okay, and this advice here, I think, shouldn't even be in brackets. This should be in bold and bright colors. Talk with the operators. Because every problem I've ever solved successfully in the company has been the operator's advice that's helped to solve it. The people in the offices almost never understand what's going on. Okay, there's a, Another part of the, it's not related to startup and shutdown, it's when we do regeneration. This is actually a startup and shutdown, but we don't consider it a startup and shutdown because it happens so frequently. So this is a periodic operation that happens normally, but it is a, a quick shutdown and a quick restart. So for example of that is if we take our catalyst out and we have to regenerate it, or we have an adsorbent that needs uh, to be regenerated, or surface that needs to be um, decoked, so in a reactor or in a boiler, we've got to remove that coating or filtration step, we need to empty out and back flush the filtration. So we've got a unit that needs to be periodically stopped, cleaned out, stopped, cleaned out, stopped, cleaned out. So that's the regeneration step, step. and there's a switching time as well. There's a time required for regeneration. 
and ideally that regeneration time is less than the switching time. If you can't regenerate fast enough, you're not going to get back get the unit back up into service. Again. So for regeneration, we often see this. Um, those of you in 4M, uh, we've, we've seen this uh, in our flow sheets there. We've got a pack bed that's being operated, being absorbed, while this bed is being regenerated. Once the, this bed is full, we, we close this valve, open this valve, and we, we start to go down this bed while this original bed is being regenerated. So again, parallel structures boost our reliability, they boost our flexibility to operate the process. An alternative with that is, let's say we've got a filtration unit, they're in gray, is the period of time that I need to shut down the filtration unit to start back flushing it. I can accumulate inventory here in the upfront tank while I'm back flushing. Then when I bring this unit online, I can start to draw down from this unit and, and send to the next storage. So we can, again, get some form of decoupling using intermediate storage. But either, either approach would work parallel or, or storage tanks. Again, capital costs are going to be involved in either option. But you could look at the relative trade-off whether I go in parallel. Maybe the cost of this second bed costs more than, than having an intermediate storage tank. Though the parallel bed gives you a bit of flexibility, which the storage tank does. So if, you pack, if this was a packed bed or filtration unit, if this goes offline, three units in series, overall reliability is dropped off. Whereas this one is my parallel structure boosts my reliability. So these are topics I want you to think about and, and explore in your SDL project. And it's going to increase your capital costs as well. So that storage tank that you're going to add in now to your flow sheets to get your reliability up, or this parallel separator that you might have to add in, it's going to add, add to your capital costs. But uh, that, that can be justified. It can easily be justified by looking at the process economics of it. You can look at, well, what will happen if this pack bed is down for a month of lost production and trade that off on the cost of purchasing a second pack bed to be running in parallel. Another, another type of startup and shutdown we have to deal with, uh, hopefully not too frequently, but, but will happen is maintenance of systems. So with this heat exchanger network, we looked at this last time, this bypass we, we looked at last time, we looked at adding that for a different reason. That's not what we're focusing on here. So the reason for that bypass was discussed last class. What we're looking at here now is if I've got an intermediate heat exchanger or a unit, not necessarily even a heat exchanger, that needs to be taken out of service, we often see these sort of constructions around them on our flow diagrams. So we'll have a bypass around the heat exchanger and a bypass around sorry, and another on the, on the other street. So in this case, both streams are process streams that contain materials or feeds that we're interested in. There's one feed coming across and my other feed vertically. Bypasses on both of those. Though the comment here is if this was say a steam or some other or cooling water or utility, we typically won't bypass those um, like that. But my feed, I do, if this is a process stream, I do need to bypass so that I can keep sending this feed onto a downstream unit that's relying on it. Whereas a utility, I can shut down that steam or cooling water for a period of time without affecting the process. And then the other final justification for storage capacity or uh, intermediate storage is when you get an interface between a batch process and a continuous process. It doesn't happen often in, in petrochemical, but for those of you that will work in foods, pharmaceuticals, you'll definitely see this all the time. We have parts of our processes operating continuously, for example, packaging. The packaging line does not stop, but production of the pharmaceutical product or the food product, those are produced in essentially just big pots. And that's all that pharmaceutical is, it's just a big kitchen or a big laboratory scaled up. And so they'll run these batch reactors, pump them to storage tank, and then move to a second step that's operating continuously. So in this example, I'm taking my fine chemical I produced here, and then I need to maybe remove some impurity by a continuous distillation. 
So to decouple my batch process that's producing product and then not producing, then it's producing product and not producing, so that's inconvenient, is I'll have a storage tank in the middle that takes up that capacity and I draw back down on it later on. This is important um, in the design of these flow sheets where you've got batch versus continuous interfaces. Some of the graduate students here at Mac look at what the optimal sizing of, and of those units are and where those units should be placed um, according to the plant's capacity. There's, it's a, it turns out to be a very complicated nonlinear integer um, uh, problem that you have to solve. It. So it's an MINLP is where do you place those tanks and how many of them and what size they should be uh, can, can affect the capacity. Okay, so, so then the final thing just to talk about before we wrap up here is just to come back to this issue of recycle. Now, we've, I've mentioned this in passing already. If I had a feed increase up here to the entrance of the track there, so I've got a feed increase in temperature over time. Over time, I would see some sort of set function, some some form of increase over time in my feed. We're going to get that recycle coming back to bite us. So I've got a warmer stream than normal coming through here. It's been preheated, goes to the reactor, and it's coming out warmer than it did in the past. Then on a second time round, there's warmer still, and the third time round, even more heat. So essentially, I've created a feedback loop here with a positive gain positive sign. I've created a system that's going to really hurt me from a safety point of view. I'm saving a ton of money regularly, but I'm not capable of handling this disturbance. This is an expected disturbance that could easily happen is that my feed temperature from my storage tank or from some upstream unit experiences an increase. I need to be able to handle that disturbance in a way that doesn't lead to unreliable operation, especially from a safety point of view. So two ways that one could address it. One is by putting temperature control on the on this stream entering the reactor. So I make sure that I don't exceed some critical inlet temperature. And I can enforce that by adjusting this temperature on this supplementary stream. I cannot control the flow and temperature of this effluent from my reactor. But what I can do is I can size these heat exchanges so that this heat exchanger up here provides most of the heat, and then I use the secondary heat exchanger to top up the additional heat required. And I can back off on that when needed to avoid this positive recycle, or at least to mitigate. This is okay, but somewhat inflexible, um, for the same reasons you saw in assignment seven. For example, if there was condensate accumulated in here, I could open that valve, I could rapidly move in one way, but less rapidly in, in the other way. So what's, what's more sensible in this, issue, in this scenario is to do bypass. So we're back to bypass again as a way to solve our problem. We saw this in, in the previous class where we have very rapid dynamics if we can take this colder stream and blend it in at that point that's a very fast process from a dynamic point of view, blend in that cold stream and then those ratio of flow rates of preheated feed and my cold stream, I can control that much more rapidly with that sort of structure on my flow. And from a cost perspective, I can also make some cost reductions in this way because now I can pretty much use my flow rate here as a way to control temperature and this energy that I'm essentially getting for free from the exothermic reaction and I can minimize this use of this utility. So I can really cut back on my steam usage as a way to control that temperature. Okay, so this is the last slide then. The key principles that you must bear in mind is when you put recycle, you have some form of adjustable energy provided to the process. And for material, we have a bypass.